Lips red as the rose, hair black as ebony, skin white as snow. Snow White. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs opens with a message from Walt Disney himself thanking his staff. The following credit sequence names two women, Dorothy Ann Blank under story adaptation and Hazel Sewell, credited as one of the art directors. But behind the scenes, there were hundreds of women working under Sewell in the ink and paint department, one of the most crucial elements in the early days of the studio. When Walt Disney came to Hollywood in 1923, the first employees he and his brother hired weren't animators. They were blackeners, women who used ink pens and black paint to transfer each frame's drawing onto a sheet of transparent celluloid material to be photographed against a background. Women were seen as innately suited for this type of labor. Tedious, repetitive, and, at the time, quite simple. It was believed that their nimble fingers could uniquely handle the detail-oriented task, kind of like sewing. It's also why there were so many women editors, including Hazel's sister-in-law, who edited The Wizard of Oz. The first hire was Kathleen Dollard, who was recommended by Walt's friend, Hazel Sewell. Soon after came Anne Loomis and Lillian Bounds, Hazel's younger sister, who would later end up marrying Walt Disney. Eventually, Hazel began working there herself. When the group moved into a larger space in 1926, renaming themselves Walt Disney Studio, Hazel Sewell was assigned by Walt as the head of the Blackeners, making her the first woman in the animation industry to run her own department. As the studio's animation got better and better, so did the blackening. These women began to take advantage of celluloid's transparency and used multiple sheets for a single frame, something that no other studio was doing. Despite all the progress they were making, the film industry had a sudden shock. Wait a minute, wait a minute, you ain't heard nothing yet. With the introduction of talkies, cartoons were declared dead. Walt was having trouble selling Plain Crazy, a cartoon that had been inked in secret in his garage by a handful of women, including Lillian and Edna Disney. This cartoon featured a familiar mouse. The studio had to adapt to survive, and they did, introducing sound to Mickey Mouse with Steamboat Willie in 1928. At the same time, they began making Silly Symphonies, a series of cartoons set to music. The first Silly Symphony, The Skeleton Dance, was single-handedly inked by Mary Tebb. When the studio was reorganized as Walt Disney Productions in 1929, Hazel Sewell's department was now operating under the name Tracing and Opaquing. Tracing was the inking process. Opaquing referred to the process of painting on the back side of the cell to preserve clean lines. The department was more structured, with Marie Henderson and Grace Christensen being put in charge of the tracing and opaquing divisions, respectively. Their work continued to develop under Sewell's leadership, and when a new building for animation was built on the Hyperion lot in 1931, the old building was given to her 15 employees, now called the Tracing and Painting Department. At the time, these women used black, white, and gray to paint the cells. It's what they were using to paint a silly symphony short called Flowers and Trees, before a new technology would come along and change everything. Oh, Technicolor. While some of the studio's films had been using early color methods like tinting, Walt Disney was hesitant to make the switch to full color. Cartoons sold well in black and white, he said. Why change? Hazel Sewell and her team worked closely with Technicolor representatives to figure out a path forward. The department went through multiple rounds of color tests, paying close attention to how the paint colors changed when photographed and projected. Flowers and Trees was photographed in black and white first as a backup, and then the back of each cell was carefully cleaned and repainted in color. The film was finished only two days before its premiere, and it was a huge success, winning the studio its first Oscar. Color was here to stay. As the studio continued to innovate, Walt had the idea to create a feature film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. In 1934, Dorothy Ann Blank did story treatments to turn it from a classic fairy tale into an entertaining film. The color model department made reference sheets to decide the exact colors and line weights for each character. Inkers and painters would use these documents to stay consistent at every stage. With all this done, production began. In 
In 1935, a new building was made for the women, now called the Ink and Paint Department. With separate areas for inking, painting, and checking, the team was turned into an efficient assembly line of 50 women. As production on Snow White continued, it would grow to almost five times that amount. Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston, two of Disney's nine old men, the core animators of the studio, said, It is one thing to say that the drawings were traced onto the celluloid, but quite another to do it. Disney anchors had to balance attention to detail with efficiency, with some adopting strategies like holding their breath to keep steady. As the department continued to expand, Hazel Sewell introduced classes and workshops for the women of ink and paint. They learned new techniques from visiting artists, attended lectures on color psychology from scholars, and more. New hires needed to have a strong background in art, demonstrating good line work and painting skills. But celluloid is different from paper and canvas, and there was a rigorous, months-long training process. Inking was first, and if a trainee's work wasn't steady or efficient enough, she was moved to painting. After inking was done and checked against the background, the cells went to the painters, who took a look at color reference sheets and ordered the correct paints to be sent to their desks. Painters would work on one color at a time and dry it for several hours before moving on to the next. Technique was essential. Paint had to be applied smoothly, as any streaks or bubbles would expand when the cells were pressed down in the photography stage. To be a painter, you also had to know about the paint itself. Part of the training process involved learning how the paint was made. A powdered pigment was mixed with the binder fluid to create the vibrant colors seen on Snow White's red apple and the Evil Queen's striking green eyes. At this point, the painters were using commercial paints, but they were not made for celluloid and would often crack or melt in the California heat. In 1936, Mary Weiser was a supervisor in the color model department. She saw how the use of commercial paints was costing them time and money and took it upon herself to meet with vendors and learn about paint chemistry. She determined that Disney should become the first animation studio to make its own paints. By the end of the year, her paint lab was up and running. Don't tell me you cook all this yourself. Uh-huh, secret formulas and everything. And trust me. The paint lab had mills to grind up the pigments, often going through as many as 10 rounds to create a fine powder. Weiser sourced pigments from all over to create rich hues that had never been seen before. The employees had a spectrophotometer to check the colors against the reference sheets and match them if they faded on the shelves. However, many of the women claimed they could do a better job matching by eye. The introduction of the paint lab meant that the painters could use more colors than what was commercially available. Over the course of Snow White's color tests and production, the palette grew to 1,500 different shades. They decided to move to a more subdued color palette, one that they had tried out in shorts like The Old Mill, out of a desire to achieve a realistic storybook aesthetic, but also a genuine fear that audiences would not be able to handle bright colors for too long. While all of this was happening, Mary Weiser was continuing to study, creating manuals and other reference materials as she forged new ground. She also filed two patents, one for a method of creating depth and texture effects in animated cartoons by stacking cells with transparent paints and textures, and another for a waxy pencil used to create that texture. Expert inkers got to work on close-up shots, while accomplished painters handled special effects like lightning and rain, which often used transparent paint. When the painters finished, the cells were checked again under the lights before being sent to the camera room, stacked against the background, and photographed for the film. For Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, the ink and paint department was still working three weeks before the premiere to finish up the last cells. 24 animators were credited on screen, but there were 66 inkers and 178 painters translating their drawings into colorful cells. And these women are often forgotten when we talk about the first cell animated feature film. Despite their artistic and technical innovations, inkers and painters often went underappreciated. For many years, ink and paint was the only option available for women at Disney, other than positions as secretaries and stenographers. A rejection letter in 1938 told one applicant that women do not do any of the creative work in connection with preparing the cartoons for the screen, as that work is performed entirely by young men. This is a perfect example of the times they lived in. Women's contributions were undervalued, while the men's work was celebrated. And in general, women in the workforce were often held back from promotions because they were expected to leave once they got married.
Hazel Sewell's legacy remains today, as she is responsible for building Disney's ink and paint department into an efficient assembly line and fostering the development of new artistic techniques. And Mary Weiser's Painter's Bible, the culmination of all the research and tests she had done on cell painting methods, helped train future painters at the studio. In 1941, Walt Disney lifted the restriction on women animators and began promoting employees from the ink and paint department. These women began to work on in-betweens, essentially filling in the gaps between the main drawings done by an animator. This was, in part, a business decision, as war was on the horizon, threatening to take men away from the studio. The first woman to be promoted to assistant animator was Ray Medby a few years later. Disney's first feature film would not have been possible without Hazel Sewell, Mary Weiser, and every woman who worked for them over the years to build the ink and paint department. These women made up the largest category of workers at animation studios. We should know more about them. Even today, it's hard to move up in the industry. Over half of animation school graduates are women, but only a few of them go on to work in lead creative roles. Disney princesses have been around since the 1930s, but the first time a woman directed one of these movies was in 2013 with Frozen. When we talk about animation history, we need to talk about everyone, because once we recognize the artistic contributions that women have been making from the very beginning, we'll be able to build a better industry for all of us.